You know, the great challenges that we all face, among the challenges that we all face is the challenge of, of challenges. We're, um, we, have, we make certain plans, we uh, assume they'll, our lives will go by a certain script, and then we're thrown a curveball here and there. Situations where we do not expect spontaneous, sometimes undesirable setbacks, the list goes on. Who in life has not experienced some disappointment, some challenge, something that threw you for a loop? Sometimes, God forbid, even traumatic experiences. We will all go through losses and so on. The real test, the real uh, litmus test, um, in Hebrew there's a word, Evan Haboichen. It's called the, the stone that measures, the measuring stone, the real measuring uh, yardstick that determines a person's character and defines a person's character is not when things are going well, but when things are not. When things are, are unexpected or un, unprepared for, that's when you see the distinction between people. Because when things are going well, everybody has just follows along that script and they have their patterns, routines, and so on. But then when something strikes and we're not prepared for it, something that, uh, that, uh, that we did not uh, anticipate, that's when you really see what a person is made of. In uh, Hebrew, there's an expression that if you want to really see the character of a person, it's bikisei, bikaisei, or bukaisei. Bikisei means in his pocketbook. When it comes to money, bikaisei means when he gets angry, bukaisei is when he takes a drink. So in Hebrew, all three words have the same similar, they have the same letters, chachof and samach, pronounced differently, kis, kais, kas, and kois. So chof samach, one is with a yud, one is with an ayin, and one is with a vov. And uh, it's just an example of all those three areas are things that we are not, we are, we, we are not uh, uh, within a particular choreography or outside of the regular um, structure. And that's when you really see what a person is made of. And of course, as the Jewish people, as a collective, have undergone such challenges throughout history more than any other nation, and look what the Jewish people have, have uh, developed, how they learned to thrive. In the verse, in the words of the verse in the book of, Je- of Exodus, right in the beginning, Kashayana Esam, as they were oppressed in direct proportion, Ken Yirba Vechen Yifritz. That's how they thrived and they proliferated. So the question is, what is the secret behind it? Why do some people find it easier to turn an, a liability into an asset, and some people simply do not? Why do some people learn to thrive, and others crumble. And is there something that we can learn? Is there a method? Is there an approach, an attitude? And that's what we all shall be addressing. One of the primary reasons addressing this is besides the contemporary value of this message, is also because of the week's chapter. We read a double chapter in the second chapter, which is the final chapter in the book of Leviticus, is among the three chapters in the Torah where you find what was called the teichacha, that ostensibly seemed to be like curses, negative expressions that if you don't do this, this will happen to you, etc., etc. Basically, that uh, warning the Jews that if they follow the commandments, they'll be rewarded. If they don't, they will be punished. Which itself, as I've talked about many, many times, and I must immediately qualify, reward and punishment in Judaism is not some type of juvenile exercise where uh, a parent or a principal is punishing us for misbehavior. You know, God and the human race are pretty distant from one another in the sense where this is one is a creator and the other is a creature. Why would a creator punish his creatures? And uh, what are we, just like subjects and slaves? And what does God gain from it? The reward and punishment, schar and enish in Hebrew, really means, as the Shalah explains, cause and effect. There's a structure. When you put your hand in fire, God forbid it gets burnt. When you eat the right foods, the healthy foods, it makes your body healthier. You eat the wrong foods, it toxifies and pollutes our systems. So these are not punishments, these are cause and effect. And what God put into place, just like any engineer would put into place, is a whole series of checks and balances, a whole immune system, if you wish, where, which is built in that based on our behavior, that's how the action will cause a reaction. It's a perfectly logical system, the entire universe works based on that. So when we read punishments, we shouldn't be reading punishments, we should be reading effects consequences of one's behavior not in any way just to get even or 
Now, of course, there's the concept of discipline, learning a lesson. When you reward someone, you reward children, you're basically telling them this behavior is admirable, is acceptable, is commendable. And that's why they get a reward, so they understand that. And you reinforce that element, that value. And, of course, if they do something, God forbid, not well, you, you, you remind them and show them that this is not acceptable by inflicting something that would give them a distasteful experience to know that this behavior is associated with something that is inappropriate. Now, obviously, when done right, it's a very effective system. Hopefully, Yemin Mekarevis, we always put more emphasis on the love and the kindness and less on the negative. But even when there's a necessity for discipline, it's done with a bare minimum and done with, saturated with love. It's not coming from anger. It's not coming from vindictiveness. It's not coming from vengeance. It's not coming from our own short fuse and, dis- and comfort zones. It's coming from a true, genuine interest in helping another person, whether it's a child, a student, or a friend, and so on. And that can come, and that you can, has to also be conveyed together with the discipline. So, however you twist and turn it from a Jewish point of view and a healthy point of view, reward and punishment is cause and effect and used as, as a tool for growth. And there's two ways to grow. One way is to grow is to reinforce and reward a positive behavior, and the second is to avoid, avoid and thwart negative behavior, behavior by demonstrating that this is not acceptable. This is true in any given school or system or army or even in, in, in sports there are pen, pen, penalties for inappropriate behavior and there are penalties for, uh, for, for various different fouls and so on. Why? Because it's besides the fact there are rules, it's also showing this is not acceptable in this uh, venue, in this uh, structure and so on. <coughs> You will judge the nation, the community, and you shall preserve them. So even when you judge, judge meaning when the judge is sat in judgment, the goal was to preserve, the goal was to help improve and help everyone grow. So that's somewhat of a footnote, even though not completely, as we shall soon see. So when you read all these strong statements, you wonder, what is it's so intense and especially when you think of it in this term, okay, let's say it's consequences and cause and effect, fine. So what happens if I did something wrong and now there was an effect? A setback. So setbacks that I was referring to before can take on two shapes. Ones that are a result of our actions. We make our mistakes. What do you do then? And then there are those that are not the result of our actions, the result of God's actions, or the result of someone else's actions. Where there too, it can be a, is a liability. So liability can be that we are responsible for that liability, and it could be not responsible. Both of them require still advice and a formula how to address them. What do you do after the fact? You've made a mistake. You made a malicious mistake even. Then what happens then? It's all over? Absolutely not. We know there's the concept of tshuva in Judaism, the idea of return, the idea of repair. There's nothing, nothing lost. Obviously, it's a little more perhaps intense when you, you yourself are, are to blame because of a certain behavior. But nevertheless, even when you put your hand in fire, there are, the body has a healing system. And the same thing is spiritually and psychologically and emotionally. So that's what we're addressing, turning liabilities into assets. Or you can put it in the terms of the Torah, turning clawless into brachas. Turning curses into, into a blessing. Where it says that God transforms a curse. And here we'll talk a curse as in a liability into an asset. Hafakti of Lam Lasimch is another statement that's used, especially when we talk about the times of the nine days, the three weeks, and of course the counting of the Omer as well, which we are now, which is sadder periods that I shall transform of Lam, your, your sadness, your mourning and grief, into Simch, into joy. These concepts are themes that you find throughout the Bible, throughout Tanakh, the idea of transformation, a liability into an asset. So what is the secret? And what is the formula? Now, of course, Introduction number one is that in Judaism, wisely, there are no magic tricks. There's no button you press and say, oh, okay, the past is gone, now a new future. It takes work. It takes discipline. It takes paying attention. So the first step in all issues is awareness of the problem. If you don't acknowledge and you're not aware or you're not aware of the problem, the problem just exacerbates. So the first step is facing the situation as is. Denial, saying, no, it's not really a liability, it never happened, it wasn't at fault, it was someone else. Oh, I didn't even know it happened, etc. Yeah, we all may go through such a stage, but it's not a stage of growth. 
Now, in certain severe situations, denial happens to be a healthy process for the and part of the immunity of the of the human being is overwhelmed by a situation. So, some ways we have to be in a, some form of denial. But there comes a point in many situations where we need to confront and we need to deal with it. The second thing we need to know is the nature of liabilities in the first place. So there's a fascinating story told in the Talmud, in Moed Cotton, um, uh, uh, page 8b, where there's a story where Rav Shema Bayechoi, who we just honored his Lagba Omer, his Yem Helula, his passing, as he asked that it be honored in a joyous way, where there you go again is an example of finding joy within, even though it seems like ostensibly was a negative, a, the passing of a great Tanet, Sadik and uh, sage and mystic, Rav Shimon Bayechoi. The story goes that um, that he was once sent his son, Rabbi Lazar, for ble- to be blessed by the sages in a particular city. He went and to visit them, said, my father sent me, and he came here for the blessings. And to his chagrin, instead of hearing blessings from them, they began to curse him. To his eye, ears, it sounded like curses. And he was no slouch. Talk about a great sage himself, Rabbi Lazar. He heard curses. He was so disturbed, he came running back to his father and said, they were not, they cursed me. They didn't bless me. And his father said, asked him, what did they say? And he began to repeat what they said. The exact details of the blessing and the curse, I'm not going to go through here because I've done that in the past. And if you're interested, just send us an email uh, to MeaningfulLife.com, WisdomReb at MeaningfulLife.com, or go on our website and search Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shem and you'll find the entire uh, story in the Talmud there. But here what is relevant is, his father said to him, no, they were not curses, they were truly blessings. And he proceeded to explain how they were blessings. Okay, fine. Question is, why? Why did these sages have to mask their blessings in language of curses? So commentaries all discuss this and, and all kinds of reasons. Some said because they wanted to elicit from him chidud, sharpness, that he should use his mind to recognize the blessings. Others say that in truth they saw that his destiny included negative experiences so they wanted to transform it. So they used that same experience but they said it in a way that when interpreted correctly is actually a blessing. And the list goes on different explanations. Again, it's all in that article that written about this. Transforming blessings, curses into blessings. But then the explanation of the Kutte Torah which is the, the, the body of discourses delivered by Rabbi Shneir Zalman of the Adi, the Alter Rebbe. So in the Pasha B'chukaysa, he talks about curses and blessings. He brings this story, and he says that uh, this story can be understood with the concept that he addresses there, the concept of the difference between hidden chesed and revealed chesed. Chesedim nestorim, chesedim uchusim. That even though ostensibly it appears that when someone is kind to you, is loving they express kindness and love by doing things, by sharing, by gifting, etc. Yet there's another form of expression of love that comes in the form of a hidden form. You don't see ostensibly on the surface, you don't see the love and the kindness. Sometimes it takes on the shape of the opposite. But when you dig and you begin to really realize long term, you realize it's even deeper affection and deeper love within what seems to be a concealed state question is, why is it concealed then? It's not to trick us, it's not to fool us. It's concealed because sometimes the intensity of the love and the affection is so profound that anything you would do would not do justice to it. And therefore it comes in the form of a concealed state. So concealment doesn't always mean something isn't there, it just means it's too intense for you to contain in a revealed way. So it's embedded in a concealed state. You have examples for this in technology, in science, that some energy is so profound, so intense, that we don't see it because of its intensity. It's beyond the scope of our senses. It's beyond the scope of our tools and instruments. Take atomic energy, nuclear energy. You don't even see, you don't even know the potency of it until it's finally released through fusion, fission, the different processes necessary to release nuclear energy. Same thing with a human being. 
I mentioned earlier, we don't see what a person is like until they're put under pressure. And then you see, and the expression of one person said that a woman is like a tea bag. You don't know how strong she is until you put her into hot water. So the hot water, the pressure, brings out something that you would never be able to see when the pressure was not there. So think of our own beings, human beings. When things are going well, so we use the natural and we use the, the usual amount of energy that we have. But then suddenly you're challenged, suddenly there's resistance, suddenly you're in a situation where you have to really get out of a pickle, a pickle or a, t- a tough place. What do you do then? You exert much more energy. Let's say you find yourself trapped, even on a physical level, in a, in a pit. Your leg is trapped. What do you do? You exert even more energy in order to fight that obstacle or impediment and free yourself. You want to reach further? You have to reach back inward more, like a bow and arrow. The farther back, farther further that you want to shoot it, the more you have to pull back. And the same is true in any given situation. When there's pressure, we exert more energy. Hazayis, the, the owl of the Talmud tells us, does not release its oil until you press it. So pressure brings out what? Hidden strengths. So why are they hidden? Why are they not there? Because they're hidden because their intensity is such that it's beyond the usual measure. So for example, you have a flow of uh, energy going through a particular pipe. That pipe is, is, can, can contain that amount of energy. What happens if you want to send more energy that's more than this pipe can contain? Or this uh, wire or, the, or this uh, channel? You need to either get a bigger channel or you need to conceal it in a way that it should not overwhelm the circuits or else it will destroy the whole process. So they remain concealed and hidden. What we would say in the language of Hasidic thought is that we have koiches gluim, we have revealed faculties, and we have koiches nalomim, we have concealed faculties, hidden faculties, so, so to speak, our potential. But it's there. The proof it's there is that when pressured, suddenly where does it come from? It doesn't come from nowhere. So you're going back deep, deep you're digging deeper into the inner reservoirs and resources of our spirits, our souls, to elicit more power and more energy. When a person exercises, when you build your muscles, all these are examples of taking more of the hidden and revealing that which is hidden. So when you think of it in this context, which is greater love and which is greater power? Is it the chesed, the kindness, the affection, the blessings that are revealed or the blessings that are concealed? The answer, of course, is those that are concealed. However, you want the concealed not to remain concealed. You want that to be revealed as well. When Rabbi, Allah, Rabbi Lazar went to the sages for their blessings, and they heard the blessings, had they given regular blessings, that God shall bless you, you should be healthy, long life, those are beautiful blessings. But is that why Rabbi Lazar traveled so far from his father sent him? He could have gotten those blessings in his own city. There were probably good sages there as well. But his father sent him specially there because these sages were able to elicit and bring out blessings that, he, that never could be seen by most could not recognize these strengths within him. So the language they use sounded negative, but really within it lie concealed lie the more powerful chesed. So one could argue, okay, fine, that explanation makes sense, but why does it have to be negative? Let it be concealed. It can be concealed; doesn't have to take the shape of a negative experience. A negative experience implies something that is not fitting, and the answer is negative itself is all in the eye of the beholder. It is true that we do have an objective sense of negativity. God forbid a, a premature loss, any death, um, disease, infection, poverty, the loss of a job, the breakdown of a relationship. These are, Everyone agrees these are all negative experiences. When I say perspective, I didn't mean that some see it as negative, some see it as positive. Is the question is to look at the situation in the full context of it the full context. In a healthy situation, there is really no such thing as a complete break. If something breaks, it's in order to build something greater. So what it appears right now as a negative is really the loss of a particular situation or condition in order to gain something greater. If, for example, an egg would never crack, a chick would never appear. If a child in his womb would would remain there and everything was comfortable, there would be no break the child will never emerge. 
So in any metamorphosis, there's a situation that if you look at it at the moment, it seems like something is breaking. It looks like something as negative is happening. When in truth, in it lies a much bigger story. And you see this consistently in life. You can see it when, for example, when children lose their teeth, baby teeth, in order for adult teeth to grow. If they didn't know adult teeth were growing in, you think, why am I losing my teeth? I need my teeth to eat, to, to uh, break down food, etc. But then you realize, because the small teeth, the mouth is getting larger, and the small teeth are just leaving, are, are there, they're getting in the way. When they serve their role, great. But once they didn't, don't have their role, they need to fall out. You need to shed one layer of skin to assume another layer of skin. This is the rule in existence. This is the um, what was called in Kabbalistic and Hasidic thought, yesh, ayin, and yesh. It's a theme I've addressed a number of times, that every state of being is a yesh. It needs to go through some type of void or vacuum where it loses its identity in order to assume a greater identity. We all go through the awkwardness of adolescence as we grow from child to adult. Every form of creativity is preceded by frustration. The greater the creativity that emerges, the more the frustration that precedes it. Everything goes through. You have to melt something down before you reshape it, if it's going to be a true metamorphosis. The caterpillar goes into the cocoon, into its own um, chrysalis, in order then to emerge a beautiful butterfly. I know some of you may say not all butterflies are beautiful, but every part of nature is beautiful. Caterpillar is also beautiful in its own way. And yet it goes through that stage in order for it to spread its wings. And this is the fact of life. We leave our parents' homes, lech lecha ma'atzacha, in order to spread our own wings and grow with our own individual strengths. And there's always going to be a painful element of the transition. The pain is because we see only that moment and we don't see the entire picture. So why it takes on sometimes a negative is because it's negative compared to your previous state. But it's not negative compared to the few, the next state. If you saw, for example, a beautiful building being dynamited and completely demolished, you'd say, why are you destroying such a powerful building? But if you came a month or two or three later and you saw even a greater building being built in its place, you realize why they had to raise with a Z the building initially in order to build this one. If you didn't come around, you'd say, hey. So it's like seeing the frames of a film and you only saw the beginning, you didn't see the ending. Obviously, in life, you're going to find times where things seem to be setbacks. So these two perspectives are actually captured, again in the Talmud, by a teacher of Rabbi Shema Bayechai, Rabbi Akiva, who with, together with his colleagues were gazing at the Harabayas, at the Temple Mount, after his destruction. So they saw desolate ruins, and his colleagues began to cry, and began quoting the verses that prophesied that this temple would be destroyed. And Rabbi Akiva began to laugh. Why? His, student, his colleagues asked him. So he said, because you quoted the first half of the verse. The second half of the verse is, after desolation will come even a greater building, even a greater presence. And the conclusion of the Talmud says, Akiva nechamtani, Akiva nechamtani. Akiva, you have consoled us. Akiva, you have consoled us. Double. The double is for the revealed and for the hidden. It's not just enough to say, oh, there's something positive. The negative itself has to be transformed into the positive. So there's the positive, first the Chama was revealing the positive, and the second is the transformation that even the negative actually also becomes a catalyst, becomes a springboard, and fuels the energy of the positive even more than revealed good. And this is a simple example would be, for example, let's say you build a dam that is um, uh, um, that is impeding and not allowing the flow of water to flow. So the dam becomes a very strong resistant force, a big dam. The water begins to build, 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 build. And then, for argument's sake, let's say it's important for you now to release the water. And you open up the dam. Or, the contrary, the water becomes so built up so powerfully, it just breaks through the dam. What kind of intensity will that water have? Intensity you would never have seen before. You would never have seen it before because it was concealed. The water is flowing regularly. You just see regular water, like I mentioned before. The impediment is what allowed that force to be built up, 
to the point that not only does it break through, but even the dam itself, the stones, whatever the, uh, the other uh, elements that the dam is made of, the components, all become part of the forward thrust now, and they actually become dangerous because of that, all the water is schlepping everything with it in its thrust forward, in its power. So what you see here is more than just one Nechaman, one more one consolation, it's a double consolation. Why did Rabbi Akiva see what they did not see? So it's hidden in the words, Akiva Nechamta, Akiva. The word Akiva means, it comes from the word Akiv, like Yaakov. It comes from the word the heel. The heel doesn't sound like a positive element. Yaakov was called Yaakov because he was holding on to the heel of Esau, his twin brother, who emerged first. But Hasidic thought explains that Yaakov is Yud Akiv. What does Yud Akiv mean? That even in the Akiv, even in that which is completely concealed, when you look at the heel of the foot, the Medrash calls it the angel of death within the body. The body has is like a microcosm of everything out there. What is the angel of death? Malach HaMovesh Adam, The heel. Because the heel is the one that has the least amount of revealed um, life force. It's alive, but the heel is able to take a lot of pressure. The heel is what hits the ground. It's the lowest part of the extremities of the human body. So it's symbolic of concealment. Rabbi Akiva was either a child of converts or he was a convert, which means his upbringing was one that he did not have revealed divinity, the revealed Torah, until the age of 40, did not, be, did not study. The famous story, where he meets the daughter of Kalba Besua, and f- she convinces him to begin to study. And he's walking, and then finally the story with the drops of water, where he sees how the drops are piercing through a hole, a bearing a hole, like drilling a hole into a, into a stone, and realize that if drops of water over the years can bear a hole, or bore a hole, bear a, hole a, a hole should be born through that water, an uh, inanimate stone, how much more so a soul can even at age 40 where it does not give up and it's always possible. And what he did was he used his hunger and thirst that which others did not have because they were not Akev, they were not the heel. The ones that had revealed, they had, uh, uh, they had the revealed scholarship and piety. And Rabbi Kiva using his so-called ignorance and using the lack, the lack that he had turned it into a positive force that he became not only a sage, he became the greatest. Kula Aliba the Rabbi Akiva, the entire Talmud goes by Rabbi Akiva. So he Akiva Necham Tavi, Akiva, Akiva, you as an Akiv can reveal to us the hidden concealed good that exists in every given situation, where those sages could not see it on their own. So it's no surprise that his student, Rabbi Shimon Bayechai, was able to see what Rabbi Lazar's son was not able to see, that even in the concealed he was able to see the profound good the great potential. And not only that, but how the concealed is actually just another form of greatness and goodness, but it can ha- has no choice but to come in a form, because if it came in any revealed form, it would not be as great. It, when it comes in a form that's concealed, or even more, that's negative, that seems negative, then its power is far, far greater. So what do we derive from all of this? We derive from this, our lives also have desolation, like Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues saw, Sometimes seeing things that appear like curses, as Rabbi Loza heard from those sages, to his ears. And when we look at it with our eyes and ears, with our naked eyes and ears, and with our regular senses, it may appear as a negative. And sometimes you have to recognize that for the moment and grieve and feel sad over that. But then you have to stop back, step back. And at some point you have to say, and this is the way a leader thinks. This is the way a healthy person thinks. Okay, this has happened to me. Am I going to allow that to impede, to slow down, to arrest my growth and development? Or am I going to take this as a type of dam of resistance in order to build up even stronger energy and to become a far greater person? Now, it's much easier to um, wallow in our own self-mercy and to wallow in our own self-pity and pity ourselves and say, oh, look what happened to me, all that. That's easier. Why is it easier? Because that's a natural thing most people do. But it's far more meaningful and far healthier to say that happened. And now, what do I do about it? I often share the Baal Shem Tov's analogy, the spiral staircase, because it captures it so well. He explains the Schwindel trap in Yiddish is a translation of spiral staircase. 
What swindle trap means? The swindling steps, the steps of swindling, swindling of a, like a thief. Why is it called swindle trap? Because <clears throat> when you walk up a regular set of stairs, you see the destination. Maybe many steps, but you see. Then there's a situation with a spiral staircase, which often actually saves space. When you walk up, you don't see the destination. As you climb, you turn your back to the destination many times. And right before you reach the apex, the top, you have to turn your back completely to it, and you can, for the moment, think nothing has happened. You haven't made any progress. And you may even give up. Look how sad that is. You're right there. So he gives that example for life, for the challenges of life, that sometimes we turn, when we, we don't see the destination, so we're convinced we haven't reached there. But all your efforts are really did pay off. You're just not seeing it right now. And you have to just see it through. One more step, two more steps. It's an analogy in life for setbacks. We use, think life is, 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 is uh, immobile. In truth, life is like a wheel that's turning. And just because at this moment the wheel seems to be at the bottom doesn't mean it won't continue to turn. But there's one thing that can stop it from turning. You and I. If we don't believe that it can turn or we don't accept that it's turning, then even if it is, you're not in a psychological state of mind to be able to receive the wheel as it goes upward. Because when you're negative, what happens is, the first negative is it doesn't let great things to ha- happen to you. How many opportunities may come our way? How many blessings may come our way? How many people we meet that may be the right person for us? And we didn't see it because we were blinded by our own negative energy. I've seen this a number of times with couples. And there was a shidduch is spoken a gentleman Someone introduces one man to a woman, woman to a man, and it seems like they're all right, very, very fitting, and they even think they're fitting, but then it doesn't work out. And then you hear several years later, they ultimately met. I've heard this a few number of times. I've seen it, seen it my own experiences in life. And you wonder, so what happened? So they say, we weren't there. We weren't able to see each other. Why? Because you're distracted. This one was distracted by money. This one was distracted by health. This one was distracted by some other obsession. So sometimes the greatest blessings are sent our way. We pray and they're there. But if your eyes are closed or they're looking the other way or you're by the spiral staircase, you're looking the opposite direction, you won't see those blessings. We need to create those containers. That's why we're told all, taught all these lessons. Here's how you're supposed to read those seeming curses and, and turn them into blessings. So that is why the Torah speaks about things. There's some blessings that are revealed and some blessings that are concealed. So why do they have to be concealed? Because that's how you elicit. And, that, and therein lies a far more powerful and more intense energy that does not exist in the revealed level. And even on a practical level, which of course the next question can be asked, so if that's the case, how do you reconcile it with a simple interpretation? You can't distort the, 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 the simple interpretation is that there are blessings for good behavior and there are Punishments for bad behavior. As we discussed earlier, fine. It's cause and effect. It's like an immune system. It's like your hand being put on fire. But you cannot say getting burned by your hand being put on fire is a positive. It is a consequence of a negative behavior. You shouldn't have put your hand on fire. You wouldn't have gotten burned. It's not a contradiction. Because if you indeed see the burned hand as a warning, as a uh, consequence... If a person did not get his hand burned, did not feel the pain, what would happen then? Who knows what could happen? He could lose his whole arm. So by feeling pain and feeling the burn, and actually the burn affecting, actually is a step in healing. God forbid a person's nerves are so frayed, or um, a person's nerves are so numbed, they don't feel something, would that be a blessing? So pain, and as an end in itself, is painful. But pain is a warning that you are sensitive that you're feeling something and do something about it. It's a warning signal. So indeed, even the punishment itself, so to speak, the effect has in it a positive. An additional point, which is a tremendous point, is this. When you really have someone that loves and cares about you, so as I said earlier, then there's a certain routine. Someone cares about you, you see it expressed in different ways. They buy you a gift from time to time. They, they share words, I love you. They show affection. They support you. You feel someone you can rely on. You know, the whole gamut of 
of uh, benefits that come from having a good friend, a good family member, a loving party, a loving spouse, and so on. <clears throat> However, that's the regular flow. When do you really see love is when you're in a state of crisis, when things are not going well. Then you can really see, even, and then there's even a challenge in a relationship. And then you see the real test of the metal of this relationship. And when the two people who are have going through a challenge, either with each other or their own personal challenge, and the other person is there for them, what happens? The love is far deeper. Because now they're digging to find something more powerful. The regular is not enough. You need to muster up new energy. And that there you see a love that you would never see in regular day-to-day routines. So where do you see more love? When somebody rewards someone or when someone disciplines someone? And again, I'm talking about healthy discipline coming from a productive place, a constructive place. That's not demoralizing and not coming from someone's insecurities and fears and again, their comfort zone been changed and you know just vengeance, vindictiveness, etc., etc. From a healthy place, if you put, the, put it on, you see a child is rewarded for a good deed. But then a parent who loves the child and is not, the, the last thing they want to do is discipline the child has to force themselves to discipline. That's the way it should be. Not it comes easy. You have to force yourself. And when you see a loving person forcing themselves to withhold love, even for a moment, or let's put it this way, to channel the love in a form, in a shape, in a package that doesn't seem like ostensible love because it's discipline, that and it, that and therein lies a far deeper love. Because why would they be doing that? Why would someone who loves someone do something that doesn't seem like open love? Because they love them so much and they want to make sure that they don't get their hand burnt. They want to make sure that they don't continue. They want to make sure that they improve. Again, I qualify again. This is only for a healthy person who knows. And the Torah, of course, is describing it in healthy terms. So the, so the literal interpretation of Oynish or Klola, the, 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 I want to say the curses, the liabilities, are en- at the end of the day, they are more profound expressions of love because you care enough. You know, think of it this way. Sometimes you have a friend. They're only friends when things are on a, on a nice day. Where are they on a rainy day? When you're not, things are not going well. And suddenly you realize people abandon you. They're there for the party. They're there when things are going well. They're there when you, they need you. When you need them and you don't seem to have as much, are they there as well? The real friends will be there and the real love you'll be see when things are not going well. That's an example. So you see the care. And this also spills over to the care of someone who's disciplining another person obviously with all the qualifications I made earlier, and therein lies a more profound type of love. In a world like ours, where when you tra- we travel on roads where you can end up in a road that's a great blessing, or you can end up in a road that's not a blessing, it's cr- extremely necessary not just to have people and coaches and mentors and friends that tell us where to go, but also ones that tell us where not to go. As a matter of fact, it can be even a bigger blessing if someone said, don't go down that path. I've been there. Go down this path. Or just they tell you not to go there, preventing so much heartache and aggravation and even destruction is as equal, if not more powerful, than someone telling you what path to take because they're helping you in your life to avoid extra mistakes. So in the final analysis, brachas and clawless, turning liabilities into assets require, as I said earlier, number one, awareness of the problem. Number two, the courage to face it. Number three, to realize there is that at the end of the day, every problem is part of a bigger picture. This doesn't mean it wasn't a challenge. It doesn't mean it's not painful. It just means that there are deeper strengths within you and deeper strengths within the situation that can never have been expressed without that negative, seemingly negative experience. And this applies to both things we do, our mistakes, and also things that happen by called God-driven or human or others have done something. Let's start with ourselves. You did a mistake, yes. Of course it would have been nicer not to make the mistake, but now it's after the fact. The Balshemtov has an interpretation. The Balshemtov has an interpretation that he says, uh, Wicked people um, Wicked people, he says, um, fulfilled with regrets. 
Why? Because they don't believe in divine providence. So they live with regrets. They're always living, I should have done this, I should have done that. Even if you made a mistake, even if it was intentional, even that can be redeemed if you learn from it and don't do it again. More importantly, learn what caused you to do it and turn that same energy into an asset. The greatest achievements in life are most, most often a result of a mistake or, or a, even an intentional one. But whoever it was that learned from it turned it into an asset because they saw the negative, even your own mistake, as something that can become a lesson for the future. So this time you made the mistake, the next time you don't, and you're already ahead of the game because others will make the mistake because they didn't learn from that experience. And the same, obviously, is even more so when you see things happen to you that are not in your control. Something that you could say from God, a way a person is born, challenges that come that were not done in any way you're at fault, or due to result of parents or others that have hurt you. There too, the same attitude. It's true, it's not, it's, as he says in the Geras HaKedosh, the Alta Rebbe writes in sections 21, he says, that al hanizik fa nigzam in shamayim, which means the person who's, who's suffered at the hands of another, it was already designated that you had to go through that experience. But that doesn't take away that the mazik will be judged for Rey Abhirase for his wicked choice. This doesn't mean he has a right to go do it because you deserved it, so to speak. But you have to learn the lessons of how to move forward with it and turn it into an asset. And this is the lesson that we learned from the chapter of Bachukesai, the end of the book of Leviticus, how we turn as liabilities into assets from Rabshim Shimon Bayechai. And God should bless everyone that should only have revealed good all our lives. And we should not need all these lessons. But remember, the olive needs to be pressed to produce its best fruit, its best produce, its oil. And the same is with everything in life. Now the pressure should only be healthy ones, should be ones that, that we see as being positive. But even if from time to time something may come our way that doesn't seem positive, you have to look at the big picture. Don't come to conclusions. Never, ever make a decision based on emotional, uh, an emotional distress or anxiety. Because, that, of course, you're in a situation where things seem tough. Obviously, you're going to have reactions. But you have to see it through. You have to keep climbing the spiral staircase, knowing that right before you reach the destination, right before the dawn is the darkest moment, right before you reach the destination, you will turn your back and will not see it. The key is to see it through and to stand strong and to forge ahead with vigilance, even when things may seem challenging. And we do so well when we have friends, when we have colleagues, when we have loved ones, because they help each of us support each other. Like you see in that scene with the March of the Penguins, the penguins in the coldest, 80 below degrees uh, cold of the Antarctic, they are, what they do is they all bunch together and they alternate who will be on the out, outer front line of the cold to buffer the others. But they keep alternating, and by being together, they warm each other. That's how we find strength in each other. We find strength in each other by factors that sometimes one person may be a little down, someone else picks them up. When that person is down, you pick them up. And we have such type of relationships where we really can build communities and networks of support that help us see through the difficult and challenging times in the ways that we can ultimately reveal the greatest good in all. This has been Simon Jacobson. It's Wednesday night. And uh, next week we will continue the class at uh, as usual time, 8.15 on Wednesday evenings, um, a new, new Eastern Standard Time. And uh, if you haven't signed up for our weekly newsletter or our weekly offerings, which are free, please do so at uh, MeaningfulLife.com. You can subscribe. We have a few lists, the Daily Omer um, and others, including the free Omer app, My Omer. Um, and uh, in any other way that we can help you in your spiritual journey, we're always there for you. So, until next week, everyone be very well and keep healthy.